Well, the question today is, are you a follower of Jesus? And uh, there's quite a bit of difference between clicking follow on Twitter or Facebook and being a follower of Jesus. Um, what, a, what a terrific video to think about this whole question. How am I doing at following Jesus? I have a Facebook friend who married a girl, and I was looking at her face page. I'm not a friend with hers. I was looking at it, and she had a bunch of likes there. She's, she likes Jesus and she likes Hello Kitty. And I'm thinking about that and saying to myself, my word, are those, are those the same category? <laughs> are those really the same category? The question I want to ask you to think about is, are you a follower of Jesus? I'm a follower of Jesus. And I want to say I'm an authentic follower of Jesus. I want to say I'm a serious follower of Jesus. I want to say I'm not just sort of dabbling in the Jesus thing, but I'm really all in. Well, let me read you some evidence that a person might give to say, hey, I'm a serious follower of Jesus. Um, I have 19 Bibles. One of them, I highlighted the whole thing. One of them, I have a custom-made leather cover. I have the picture of that old German guy above my table praying for his food, you know, the little loaf of bread there. I'm an authentic follower of Jesus because I've been to a David Crowder concert. I have a fish sticker on both of my cars. I read Mere Christianity, The Hobbit, The Cost of Discipleship, Crazy Love, How Shall We Now Live? I've protested abortion. I give to eight different missionaries. I always give a tract to the waiter. I can explain the difference between agape and phileo love. I've served at a soup kitchen. I've been in 12 mission trips. I have a fish tattoo on both ankles. I put a He is Risen sign in my yard at Easter. Hey, I'm an authentic follower of Jesus, right? Well, when you read the New Testament, those are not the things Jesus mentioned to say that I'm an authentic follower. When you read the New Testament, especially when you read the Gospels, Jesus had some other things in mind when he said, follow me. Now, following him always begins, always begins with a relationship with to him through trust in him. If God had two minutes to talk to you, he would simply say to you, you have a sin problem. You have violated my character. You've not done the things I wanted you to do. You have done the things I told you not to do. You've not been the person that you, that you should have been. And every honest person has to say to them, listen, I've done things. I've said things. I've thought things. I've wanted things that I should not have done. And because I've done those things, I am separated from the perfect God of the universe. Death in the Bible means separation. To die physically is to be separated from your body, and to die spiritually is to be separated from the God of the universe. And so the bad news is I have a sin problem. It separates me from God. The good news is Jesus paid for my sin on the cross. Not just for the sin of the whole world, for every sin for all time, but for mine for what I have done, for what I do today, for what I will do. He paid for that. And the further good news is I can be forgiven through putting my trust in Jesus Christ. When I come to understand substitution and I come to understand forgiveness through trust in that substitution, I enter into relationship with God. I become a, a, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I become a family member. But beyond that, how do we become a se severe, sincere, authentic follower? Is it really by putting a fish sticker on my car? I think Jesus says to us in the book of Matthew, there's just three core issues, three core actions, three foundational things that result in me being an authentic follower of Jesus. Now, here's what I'm afraid. I'm afraid we have become so sophisticated and so distracted and so busy that we forgot these three basic things. And I know in my life, I don't do these three basic things as much as I should. These three basic things are very, very simple, but they are not easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. You want to lose weight? It's really simple. Eat less, move around more. That's all there is to it. It's really simple. Eat less, move around more. It's simple, but very hard. 
If you want to be a follower of Jesus, I promise you it's simple. It's not easy, but it's really clear. I want to consider what Jesus said about being an authentic follower from the book of Matthew. And I want to begin at the very beginning of the book of Matthew, just talk about some of these paragraphs until we get up to chapter 4, where I want to focus on a particular paragraph and on a particular verse. So the book of Matthew, written by a disciple named Matthew, who was a Jewish man who had been a tax collector whom Jesus rescued, and he writes this book, and the basic purpose of his book is to say to Jewish people and to us, non-Jewish people, to say this, Jesus is the king you are looking for. So he spends this whole gospel saying, Jesus is the king you're looking for. And he starts in the very first paragraph by saying, he's the king who had the right ancestors. He had the right lineage. He had the right parents and the right grandparents. And if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, it says, there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, and 14 from David to the deportation to Babylon, and 14 from the deportation to, uh, to Babylon to the Messiah. We're talking about the king here. And then you read the next paragraph, and you find out that he was born a, a virgin, and his name Emmanuel means God with us. And his name Jesus means Savior. Joshua, Yeshua, the one who saves us from our sin. And then you read the next paragraph in chapter 2, and you find out he is the one who is born the king of the Jews. He's not like Herod, who usurped the kingship. He was born king. He deserved it. And if you further look at that paragraph, you find out he was born in Bethlehem, which is the proper town. And then you further look at that chapter, and you find out that the kingmakers from the east came to recognize him as king. They got on their faces before him. They worshipped him. They brought in gifts just like you would to a king. And if you keep reading, you find out that he had the proper forerunner, John the Baptist, who said in chapter 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom at hand? It's because the king is here. When the king is here, then the kingdom is here. The one that we worship and obey and follow. And then you read the end of the paragraph of chapter 3 where it says, Behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. God himself affirming that the Messiah was here. You read chapter 4 and you see him perfectly resisting temptation. And in the middle of chapter 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, change your mind at a heart level, because the kingdom is here. Why is the kingdom is here? The kingdom is here because the king is here. And then he goes into chapter 5, 6, and 7, says here's the principle of living under the king. But the place I want to focus is chapter 4, verse 17 down to verse 25. And I'm going to read that for you in just a moment. I want to ask you to pray with me, and then we will think about this particular paragraph and specifically about the question of what would I need to do to be an authentic follower of Jesus. Father, please guide us as we think about this paragraph together. Please guide us as we think about the question, am I following Jesus or have I just uh, clicked a button? Do I like Jesus the same as I like Hello Kitty? Father, bring this home to our hearts. Make it clear to us. Motivate us to be people who follow your son in a very serious, authentic, genuine way. Guide us as we think about your book together, and we need your help in this. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says, Now Jesus walk, was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Let me talk through this paragraph with you very briefly and ask you to think about what has happened here. 
Jesus lives in Capernaum. It's on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. He left Nazareth where he was born. He was kicked out. They tried to kill him. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. And so having been kicked out of Nazareth, he moves to the northeast, uh, maybe 15 miles at the most. And so he's living in this little town called Capernaum. It's, it's a one-horse town. It's as small as, as Richardson before the stoplight was invented. It's miniature. Everybody in this town knows everybody. There's enough Jews there, 10 male Jews, to have a synagogue. And so Jesus goes in the synagogue on the Sabbath and he teaches there and he reads the scriptures. And these people all know him. And he goes walking one day out of Capernaum along the Sea of Galilee and he finds these brothers casting a net in the sea. These brothers are fishermen. But it's very important to understand they're not, they're not fly fishermen. They're not, they're not lure fishermen. They're not dynamite fishermen. You know what a dynamite fisherman is? It's the person who throws a stick of dynamite in, blows up, all the fish rise to the surface. They're net fishermen. They cast a net in the sea. It's very important. Verse 19, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, that is, they left their income, and they followed him. Now, they followed him because they knew him. They followed him because he was compelling. They, 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 they knew he was a person worth following. This is not Jesus having a very powerful mind and overwhelming weak minds and saying, follow me. This is people saying, I know this man. I've heard him speak. I've seen what he does. I've seen the way he lives. He's a compelling man. I am willing to follow him. I will walk away from my income to obey Jesus. I will walk away from my nets to obey Jesus. So immediately they left him. They followed him. They come to another boat with two other brothers in. He says, follow me. And immediately they walked away from their income and from their family to follow Jesus. Remember Jesus' statement? He's come here to divide families, father-in-law against daughter-in-law, uh, against daughter and, and, and son against mother. And Jesus is going to be so compelling in the lives of some that they'll follow him and other people in the same family will, will, will reject their family member because they follow Jesus. These people said, he's such a compelling man, I'd be willing to walk away from my family for him. And so they followed him in verse 24. He goes around Galilee. <clears throat> Galilee, by the way, is the place where a good Jew wouldn't live. Good Jews live in Jerusalem. The rabbis used to say, if you want to be, if you want to be holy, live in Jerusalem. If you want to be rich, live in Nazareth. The people who live up in Galilee... They're people who don't really care about Judaism the way we in Jerusalem do. But he's going around Galilee, sharing the good news, speaking about the kingdom, showing that the king is here. Let me tell you the good news about the king arriving, and he's so powerful, he's healing all the sicknesses, all the diseases. The word about him is spreading everywhere. People are coming from all the Gentile areas and from the Jewish areas and even from across the Jordan. There are crowds of people coming and bringing the sick people and the demon-possessed and those with epilepsy and bringing all the people who are lame and they're just flocking in and this powerful, powerful king, the Messiah, is healing them. Having talked through that much of the passage, let me ask you to return with me to verse 19. Because in verse 19, I think, is a core message of what does it mean to be a serious follower of Jesus? Three things. Three things to be a serious follower of Jesus. Number one, if you want to say I'm his authentic follower, you've got to follow him. Now you're saying, wow, Dave, that's profound. <laughs> if you want to be a follower, you've got to follow. What's the first thing Jesus says? It's a command, and it means follow right behind me. Come from over there, however you are walking about life, and come here and get right behind me and walk through life the way that I, Jesus, would. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Walk in my way. Go about your relationships the way I do. Go about your sexuality the way that I do. Go about your value system the way that I do. Go about treating others. Go about responding to the Father. Go about valuing the word, 
go about dealing with conflict, go about all of life the way that I do. Stop walking where you've been walking over there and come walk over here, right exactly behind me. I want you to be a person who follows me. Watch the way I do it and do it just like me. When I lived in Idaho, my friend bought a, a brand new boat. It was called a jet boat, a steel hull boat. And the way it works is it sucks water in the front and it spits it out the back through this powerful jet. It's a jet made out of water and that thing will scream. I went on the first ever ride with him in his jet boat. We went up the river. We're, we're going up the Snake River in southern Idaho at 35 miles an hour against the current. We're just screaming. And we hit a sandbar. And the boat stopped in about 30 feet. And we were hung up on a sandbar. When we finally got off the sandbar, there was another jet boat driver there. And my friend was so spooked, he didn't want to drive his own boat. He said to this jet boat driver, will you take my boat back to the dock? And the guy said, no, I won't. But I'll let you follow me. I know where the channels are, he said. I know how to miss the sandbars. You get behind me, and I will lead you back to the dock. And so we got behind this other guy, and he's following. He's going. He's going. We're right behind him because this man knows the channels. He knows how to miss the, the sandbars. And this man we're following takes this huge sweep out to the left, right up against the bank, and comes back. And my friend Brad said, ah, I'm not going out there. I'm just going to cut across. And that's when we hung up on the second sandbar because he didn't follow right behind him. When I'm not walking right behind Jesus, I get my life hung up on sandbars. I get into trouble. I don't live the way he would. I don't become an authentic follower. I'm not a person who is doing what Jesus would do. In order to follow Jesus, I've got to learn from him. I've got to immerse my life in the Gospels. I've got to immerse my life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just see how he did it. He said to us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me point out this phrase in verse 29. Learn from me. And so the question is, what have I learned from Jesus lately? What have I learned? Have I learned, as he said, have I learned to be gentle? Have I learned to be humble in spirit? Have I learned to rest? Have I learned to take his yoke? What have I learned from Jesus recently? He is the one who gives me the path in which I walk. So the first issue, friends, in this, in this passage is the question, am I following Jesus walking like he would? Second issue, am I being formed by Jesus? This is the part we usually skip over. He said, follow me, and I will make you. I will form you. I will transform you. When I follow Jesus, I become a different person. Everything changes in my life, and he causes me to change and to be a, bit, a different person. Jesus is involved in transforming me. The word used here is pronounced poieso. It's the word that means to make something. It's the same kind of word. It's the same word, actually, that is used in creation, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 says, Jesus said to them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? When God made us, poieso, he created us. And then when we trust Christ, then he goes about creating us again. He goes about transforming us, maturing us. And one of God's massive values is for me to grow up. God is deeply committed to my transformation. I am not the person Jesus envisioned when he rescued me. I'm closer, but I am not there. And so if you think about God's deep commitment to transformation, Romans 12, 1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 8, 29, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, you and I are on our collision course to look like Jesus. Think about 2 Peter 1.3. He's given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Ephesians 4.13. Until we all grow up to the full stature of Christ. God is actively working to form us. It's extremely important to him that we look like Jesus. 
He would rather me look like Jesus than me be healthy. He would rather me look like Jesus than me be wealthy. He would rather me look like Jesus than me be well known. He would rather me look like Jesus than my life be easy. He's willing for me to experience all kinds of things that will not be pleasant for me and will not be pleasant for him to watch in order for me to look like Jesus. I was walking in the forest one time with a friend of mine. Uh, he was a logger. He had a son who was severely handicapped, who had braces on his legs, who had these hand braces. And when he walked, he kind of flailed. You know, he sort of looked like a, a little tornado going down the path. And we're walking out along this ro logging road, and we're going slow so his son can stay with us. His son is about 14 years old, and his son is slailing along behind us, and his son trips and falls down. And I'm rushing over to help this boy, and, and, and the father sort of grabs my arm, and he says to his son, Chad, your body's a real struggle for you, isn't it? And he let Chad get up by himself. And I'm just looking at this thinking, golly, Dad, go help your boy up. And this father was saying, Chad, your body is a struggle for you, isn't it? Get up. And Chad got up, and we kept going. Here's a father who sees this handicap and this floundering and this struggling in his son and has great compassion for his son, but at that moment thought it's really going to be better for Chad to get up by himself right there. So the Chad, as he goes through life, when dad's not there, is able and willing to get up by himself. I'm not going to stand here and say that's the best parenting technique I ever saw. I'm not trying to defend an individual incident. I'm trying to give an illustration of a person who was struggling and the father said it's better for him at this moment to struggle and sometimes our father looks at us and says it's, it'd be good for you to struggle right now it would be good for you you could grow up if you would struggle right now God is a great commitment to us looking like his son and he's willing for us to struggle the question is have I submitted to this process of growth have I dived into the process of growth through spiritual disciplines through submission to the Father, through letting Him work in my life, through focusing on maturity more than I focus on these other things like wealth and health and happiness and being well-known and being recognized and all those stuff that really, really we often fight for. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work in you, both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Now when he says work out your salvation, he doesn't mean save yourself by doing good works. What he means is God puts salvation in you. Now you work it out in your lifestyle. And it's God who's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's the power of God happening that causes me to grow. So the first issue, friends, very clearly, is that I be a person who is following Jesus. The second issue, very clearly, is that I be a person who is being formed by Jesus. And then the third issue is that I be a person who is fishing. Once I'm following... Once I'm being formed, then the third thing is that I become a person who is fishing. Followers do evangelism. Followers share. Now let me return to something. These were net fishermen. They were casting nets out, and the way these net, nets work is they hit the water, and they had a cord around the edge that had weights on the cord. And the weights would pull down and would pull the cord down and would cause the net to turn into a sort of a balloon and the bottom of it would come together and you could pull the cord and, and you would entrap everything that was inside this balloon. And you would pull it up. And you might have 40 fish in it. You might have a rock in it. You might have a bottom feeding fish in it you didn't want. You might have a boot in it. Who knows what you get? It's, um, it's just the luck of the draw. And if you pull it in, you got 40 fish, you're pretty well done for today. But if you pull it in, you got a rock, you're going to throw it again, 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 you're going to throw it again. It's extremely difficult work. Typically, they would either be on a boat throwing it, pulling it, pulling it up, or they'd be waist deep or chest deep in water, and they'd be throwing this huge, heavy, wet net out and see what they got and bring it in. I think it's a great, great, great illustration of evangelism. You throw out the net. You're sitting next to someone in an airplane. You raise the flag about Jesus. You tell your faith story. You ask them where they stand with God. You share Christ with them. Maybe you get a new believer, and maybe you get nothing. 
and then you're sitting with someone uh, in a waiting room and you've raised the flag about Jesus and you tell your faith story and you share the gospel, you throw out the net and maybe you get a new believer. Maybe you don't. But it just goes on like that. You just keep throwing out the net and seeing what you get. You keep throwing out the net and seeing what you get. You keep raising the flag about Jesus. You keep telling your faith story. You keep sharing the gospel. Sometimes you bring in 30 fish and sometimes you bring in nothing. Being a follower of Jesus means that I become a person who not only is following, living like he would, not only is transforming, being changed like he changes me, but I'm also a person who is fishing. I'm willing to raise my faith story. I'm willing to throw out the net. I'm willing to ask, where do you stand in this? Following, forming, and fishing. It makes me a lot more authentic disciple than putting a fish sticker on my car. It's really what Jesus was talking about in this situation. By way of application, I want to ask you a question. In your own culture here, what would it take to be a faithful fisherman? And let me say to you, I don't think it's very hard. I think the first thing would be to just say, I'm going to learn my faith story. I'm going to learn how to tell in three minutes my experience with Jesus. I was a person who raised in a mainline church. I knew very clearly that I had a problem, that I was a sinner, that I had violated the standards of God. I was afraid of God. I was terrified of my sin. I knew I was going to be judged by God. I was so anxious about my sin, I thought about it day and night. In my teenage years, I came to a point of what would have to be called mental illness, being worried about my sin. And in that terrific illness, in the kindness of God, when I was 19 years old, I came to understand that Jesus had paid for my sin. Not only for the sins of the world, but for mine only. And one night, reading the Gospel of John, this became clear to me. I put my trust in Jesus Christ by myself in my bedroom in Tucson, Arizona, as a sophomore in college. And I understood that Jesus had forgiven me. And since that time, my whole life has been redefined. God has taken away from me this incredible fear. God has given me the courage to live the life that he set before me. My life is not perfect, but I do have the resources I need to live my life. This is my faith story. I can tell it between uh, the first floor and the ninth floor of a building. Fear came to hope in Christ and now courage. My life's not perfect, but I have what I need to live this life. Learn your faith story. Learn to tell the gospel. Bad news, good news, invitation. The bad news, you have a sin problem. It separates you from God. The good news, Jesus paid for your sin. You can trust Christ and be forgiven. The invitation, is there anything keeping you from trusting Christ right now? Bad news, good news, invitation. It's not difficult. I think we can become people who are fishers of men by very simply learning our faith story, learning the gospel, and then asking God for opportunities. When he gives you an opportunity, open your mouth. I, before I started sharing my faith, I spent 20 years, friends, where I self-selected out of evangelism. I said, I'm afraid to do this. I don't know what to say. I don't want to look like an idiot. Evangelism is for people who are outgoing, who have the gift of evangelism, and who have a doctorate in apologetics. Evangelism is not for me. I self-selected out. I didn't want to be a part of it. Because I thought it was extremely hard to do. And I didn't want to look bad. What God showed me over the years is it's not hard to do. And it's better to look bad than to not share Christ. And I began to slowly understand that God would actually use me in this process. And that even if it was sometimes difficult or tense or embarrassing or someone said, I'm an atheist and I don't want to talk to you, even when those things happened, there was just a great, great blessing of being a part of sharing Christ. And what I found out was that God puts seekers next to Christians who open their mouth. I had these friends who used to share Christ all the time. They got all these opportunities. I'm saying, why do they get opportunities? Because God puts seekers next to Christians who open their mouths. If you were God, and you had a person close to trusting Jesus, and they were going to take an airplane flight, would you put them on a seat next to a Christian who never opened their mouth, or would you put them on a seat next to a Christian who did open their mouth? I mean, this may be news to you, but God assigns airline seats. And if you have a track record of opening your mouth, you're going, to have a, you're going to have an experience of sitting next to a lot of seekers on airplanes and in waiting rooms. <laughs> because when you start opening your mouth, Jesus says, hey, now there's a, there's, a, there's a follower who will open their mouth, and I'm going to put some seekers next to them. In very, very powerful ways, God gives us the opportunity of, sh of sharing Christ. <clears throat> Following, 
forming and fishing to where the lives of other people become extremely important to us. When I lived in Alaska, friends, we had a, a rescue situation where a fisherman who was a commercial fisherman, he had his own, his own boat, he went out in the bay off of Sitka, Alaska one Sunday afternoon with his 11-year-old son to fish. Not to commercial fish, but to sport fish. They just had their rods. They were trying to catch some salmon. It's a father and son fun afternoon on their fishing boat. And when they got out there, an incredible storm came up. They began to be buffeted. The boat began to take on water. This father gets on his radio and radios a May Day to Sitka, Alaska. And when the May Day comes in, the Coast Guard scrambles a helicopter, sends that helicopter out in the bay. They find this boat floundering. They find this father and this son. And this Coast Guard helicopter comes over, neath the, over above the boat and drops the collar down to pick them up. The father puts this harness on himself. He grabs his son. And the Coast Guardsman, who's leaning out the window, pushes the button. The electric motor starts to turn, and he starts to pull this father and son up off the boat. He barely gets them off the boat when the boat goes down. And so now he's got a father and a son dangling on a cable below the helicopter. He's got his finger mashed on the button. The motor's running. The cable is slowly coming up. Unfortunately, this father is very big, and he's holding his 11-year-old son. And the arm that's holding the cable away from the helicopter begins to bend, and it's bending. And then the guardsman smells that the motor is overloaded, and it's starting to burn. And he keeps his finger mashed on the button until he gets this father and son close enough. And he leans out and he grabs the boy and he grabs the father and he pulls him into this helicopter. And later on when the paper interviewed this Coast Guardsman, he said, I was going to save those two people or I was going to burn up our equipment trying. I was going to save those two people or I was going to tear up our equipment trying. That's the heart of a rescuer right there. I'm going to bring people to faith in Christ empowered by the Spirit, or I, I'm going to just tear myself up trying. There's a heart of compassion in there. It's the same heart that was in the Father when he said, I'd be willing to tear up my son to save these people. I'd be willing for my son to be crucified, for my son to lose all of his followers, for my son to die on the cross in a tortured way in order to rescue these people. It's the heart that's in the Father. It's the heart that, that, that he grows in us when we become serious followers of Christ. I want to turn our uh, minds and hearts now to the Lord's Supper and think about the heart that was in our Father who said, I'd, I'd be willing for my son to die to rescue them. I want to think about this Father who had such compassion for us, he sacrificed his son for us. And so we're going to ask you in just a moment to come up and bring the elements, take the elements, take them back to your chair, hold them until Pastor Sam comes up and leads us in the Lord's Supper. And I want to pray for us just a moment uh, before we do that. My Father, we thank you for your Son, for his clarity about following and forming and fishing. I pray that we would have in ourselves a heart of compassion for others that would make us serious followers, that would make us seriously committed to the process of formation, and that would make us incessant fishermen Put a heart in us that's going to re rescue people or get torn up trying. Thank you for the heart in you that rescued us, even to the point of sacrificing your son. I pray this morning, Father, that you would give us forgiveness for the ways that we've not loved you well, the ways we've not served you, the ways we've not lived in purity. We want to come to your table with clean hearts. And so we take a time now, Father, of silent confession. We confess our own sin to you before we take this table together. We thank you for the heart of compassion that resides in you and that resides in your Son. And we rejoice to draw near to you as you draw near to us in the Lord's Supper. We pray in the Lord Jesus' precious name.